So let's get started. Let's talk about Miracle in the Andes by Nando Parado. This is a book that will interest you if you are at all interested in nonfiction, survival, uh, inspiration. Uh, it's a book that's adventurous, it's emotional, um, and it's a little bit sad too. It, it can actually be a little challenging to read at times. And this story is something that I'm, I can't imagine why I did not know that this story had existed, but uh, it's written uh, on the account of, from back in 2006, of one of the survivors of a plane crash, uh, Nando Parado, who is an Uruguayan uh, survivor of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. Uh, this flight crashed in the Andes Mountains in October 1972. Uh, the book goes into great depths to talk about uh, the people who were on this team. Nando uh, was part of a rugby team. Uh, he was on this plane heading to Chile to play in a rugby match. And they talk about sort of setting the stage about how the pilots knew how dangerous it was to fly into and over the Andes. The Andes Mountains uh, were notorious for having uh, significant updrafts and wind and variable conditions that uh, even to an experienced pilot would just put the, the, the plane into a tailspin and sort of push it up and out of the air uh, in updrafts then that would you know, then obviously push them into the mountain. There had been plane crashes in the Andes for probably about as long as planes had been flying in and around the Andes. But the problem is, is that uh, almost nobody ever survives these things. And um, when their plane um, was set to take off, the pilots did not want to do it. They delayed and they were delayed by about a day. And even after the day, there still wasn't much um, safety in, in getting up in the plane at that time. And Nanda goes on to talk about how the team, which keep in mind in 1972, a rugby team, this is a group of teenagers and 20 somethings. I think maybe the oldest person in the group is maybe in their low thirties as a group uh, that they, they wanted to go. And they made fun of the pilots for not wanting to uh, get in the air. And they sort of demanded that they get flown to Chile. They wanted to play. They were tired of waiting. Uh, we can all relate to that, right? You get in the airport and you want to go, right? And the, the pilots eventually relent and decide, okay, we can go. And sure enough, uh, as they are climbing through the Andes, the plane sort of hits uh, one of these air pockets that sort of push the, the airflow up and it knocks the plane kind of off course. They're in the clouds. They're in some, some, you know, some intense fog and sort of navigating by their altimeters and their uh, equipment on the plane. The pilots tried very hard to sort of right the plane and get it going back in um, a direction up above the mountain. And they didn't make it. And so on October 13th, 1972, this plane crashes into the Andes Mountain. And the book, which I, I listened to is an audio book. It's narrated by the wonderful Arthur Morey. Arthur Morey has narrated several books that are just excellent, um, including uh, several by David Brooks that are, I think, fascinating to listen to. American Ulysses by Ronald White is narrated by him. Uh, and he has a voice that um, is perfect for this sort of setup and the emotion of this event. The, the story has been told several times in several books. There's, a, there's even a book and a movie that came out, I think in 1993, Ethan Hawke plays uh, the character of Nando. And uh, in, in these books, they're written from the account of journalists and other researchers who spoke to the survivors after they were recovered. And before we get to sort of the story about their recovery, uh, this book, which was published in 2006, uh, called Miracle in the Andes, is written as a from the first person account of Nando. And it's 30 years after the events unfolded on that mountain. And I think, generally speaking, my rule about books is you never, 
Never read the books that are written by or ghost written by the person who is the main subject because they tend to uh, they tend to gloss over things or make themselves uh, seem softer around some edges than they might otherwise be. In this circumstance, I thought that maybe there would be some development here because if you can imagine the trauma that a person goes through, like a plane crash, that your, your brain just sort of automatically ignores certain components of that, right? Like it would not be unreasonable that there are things that happen in the course of your plane crash or your trauma that your brain just pushes out of your memory. And that maybe after 30 years, um, there would be some, some recollections that would come from that that would make the story more interesting. And it also struck me as something that a person with more wisdom 30 years after this to be, you know, at this point, I think, I think he's probably in his, um, I think he's about 72 years old today uh, in 2022 that that might also offer some insight into this event. And I think that was accurate. Ordinarily, I would not be super keen to, to read a book that was written by other people or written by the actual individual in this. And even in this book written by Nando, he speaks to the fact that he thinks that when he originally spoke to some, some reporters that he may have been too crass and that maybe some of the people who survived may have been too crass, uh, that they may have, um, I don't know, that their emotions may still have been really wound up and that uh, he, he worries that it comes across in other books that the people who survived this crash were a little more self-centered uh, and a little more uh, focused on themselves and their own survival than what it turned out it really was. Or that at the very least, that the people who were surviving this plane crash together uh, were all going through the same sorts of emotions together and that they were going through all the same sorts of thoughts and feelings and biological needs as everyone else. And so there wasn't anybody who was more or less better than any of the others in terms of keeping their emotions in check and keeping you know, their, their focus on anyone but themselves. So it's October 13th, 1972. This plane goes down in the Andes Mountains. Um, Nando is there in the plane uh, and tells a gripping story about how uh, this plane sort of falls apart. It does read something sort of like uh, something out of Lost, where you know you sort of if you if you watch that show, you you imagine the sort of the back of the plane sort of falls apart. You know, a wing or an engine falls off the side. Uh, and that the people are sort of tumbling uh, and they're not really sure which way is up and that you kind of go smashing into this, this mountain. And in this case, uh, these, uh, this plane uh, kind of collapsed in two parts, right? There's the tail of the plane that had a lot of the luggage and some of the supplies that they were carrying, which wasn't much. And they uh, mostly were in the fuselage, which then landed uh, sort of in between kind of a, a gulch of two mountains. They think that when they, call, when they are in, on the mountain that they are about 7,000 feet up. Um, that's based off of some of the equipment that they were looking at from the wreckage of the plane. The problem was, was that they were actually probably closer to about 10 or 12,000 feet up in elevation. And this has a whole host of situational problems for them, right? Which is just the, the fact that you've got a group of uh, 20 and 30 somethings, including Nando's mother and sister who were there and a couple of other people who were um, sort of chartering this plane together from the Uruguayan Air Force to fly to Chile. Uh, one woman, for example, was on her way to see a wedding. And by and large, it's mostly this rugby team, mostly uh, young men at the prime of their physical health and life. Uh, they're incredibly strong men, and they just sort of see each other um, as this plane is falling out of the sky, just evaporate, right? That they, uh, that the plane, you know, as, as they are witnessing it, they're seeing, you know, an entire chair just sort of get sucked out the back of the fuselage, and those people are just never seen again. There were about 16 total survivors. Uh, 
A few that survived initially died uh, within relatively short time periods after the plane finally crested where it did in the mountain. Uh, that included Nanda's mother and sister, um, who he sort of held uh, in their dying breaths. And for the next 72 days, think about that. For the next 72 days, they had to survive on this mountain where nothing survives. The top of this mountain is so cold and so barren. There's not even a blade of grass. And so the description of this book, which I'll read for you here, uh, kind of goes into a little bit about how the emotion of this event starts to unfold. And it writes, in the first hours, there was nothing, no fear or sadness, just a black and perfect silence. Nando Parado was unconscious for three days before he woke to discover that the plane carrying his rugby team, as well as their family members and supporters to an ex exhibition game in Chile had crashed somewhere deep in the Andes. He soon learned that many were dead or dying, among them his own mother and sister. Those who uh, remained were stranded on a lifeless glacier at nearly 12,000 feet above sea level with no supplies and no means of summoning help. They struggled to endure freezing temperatures, deadly avalanches, and then the devastating news that the search for them had been called off. At the time, and Nando's thoughts, or excuse me, as time passed and Nando's thoughts turned increasingly to his father, who knew he must be consumed with grief, Nando resolved that he must get home or die trying. He would challenge the Andes, even though he was certain the effort would kill him, telling himself that even if he failed, that he would die much closer to his father. It was a desperate decision, but it was also his only chance. So Nando, as an ordinary young man with no disposition for leadership or heroism, led an expedition up the treacherous slopes of a snow-capped mountain and across 45 miles of frozen wilderness in an attempt to find help. Thirty years after the disaster, Nando tells his story with remarkable candor and depth of feeling. Miracle in the Andes, a first-person account of the crash and its aftermath, is more than a riveting tale of true life adventure. It is a revealing look at life at the edge of death and a meditation on the limitless redemption and power of love. There's a lot that's unsaid in a good chunk of this. This book uh, which I have given a five-star rating to because I think it is a phenomenally emotional and truthful account of the events uh, of that period of time between October and December. And, you know, in the aftermath of the plane falling out of the sky, his mother and his sister are dying in front of him. There are other people who are um, reported you know, he, he goes on relatively vivid descriptions. It's actually a beautifully written book. And I actually assume it's a beautifully translated book because he would have been, uh, he's native to Uruguay. And so it's been translated in multiple languages, including English. It's beautifully written. And he also tells with vivid accounts of how people appeared in those moments that the people's, you know, the calves of people's legs, in this case of young men who are at the fittest point in their lives, are just sort of ripped from the bone. He also goes on to talk about something that the press focused on relentlessly, much to their chagrin, which is cannibalism. Because remember, they're at the top of this mountain where nothing, not even a blade of grass, is growing anywhere. And they're melting water by melting some of the snow. Uh, initially, they were just eating the snow uh, to have water. The problem was, was that it was so cold that as they were eating it, they were just sort of, um, they, were, they were blistering the insides of their mouths and their lips were chapped uh, so severely that they were bleeding from their lips because they were sort of chomping on this ice. Um, and one of the things that took me a little bit to kind of understand and recognize about the environment that they're in, they were on their way from Uruguay to Chile. and they had left and expected to land in warm weather. None of them brought coats. They wore rugby shoes and shorts and sleeveless shirts. And the few um, little things that were around were like, you know, a couple of them had some sweaters, I think. And on the mountain, it was relatively mild, I think probably in the neighborhood of about 40 or 50 degrees maybe uh, during the day. So somewhat bearable, I suppose. And completely 
unbearable at night. Uh, the wind would whip up. Um, there would be freak blizzards because, again, they're on the side of a mountain, 12,000 feet up. So they use what they had. They use the fuselage to sort of huddle together, and they tell the story about how they, they moved the bodies out of the fuselage as people died, and then they moved people um, outside into the snow, and that's where they left them. Uh, not that far from where they were all sleeping and huddled at night. And for a while, they waited for rescue. They thought their best their best hope was that people would be coming to look for them. And they were right. People were coming to look for them. But the the mountain was so unforgiving and so large that nobody really knew kind of where they were. And the pilot who had been um, dying and sort of muttering to himself about where they thought that he was uh, turned out to be inaccurate. And <clears throat> eventually he died as well. And they're trying to survive, and they go for several days, as people do, without any food. They talk about how they sort of ripped everything apart that they could to find every last crumb. At one point, Nando tells a really descriptive story about how they uncovered a chocolate-covered peanut, and that he spent one whole day just sucking on that peanut to suck the chocolate off, and then the next day he sort of chewed on half of it, uh, but only just at the smallest little morsels. I, I just sort of imagine it like a, like how a squirrel might sort of chew on a on a nut, uh, and that it took him about the whole day to to consume that nut. And they did this between all of them until eventually they had to resort to cannibalism. And he describes in again very vivid detail that may be uncomfortable for a lot of people, but I, I find that he wrote with such unflinching honesty about this event. Uh, he talks about how one day he was sitting in the fuselage of this plane uh, amidst this wreckage, and there was a, sort of a bloody scab on a leg of one of his friends that was sitting there. And he goes on to account how hunger at a severe level that, that they were experiencing weeks into this tragedy does things to people that brings out such a primal instinct that you you would not imagine how you could ever do it but you also recognize that your primal instincts make you think about things and make you do things that you wouldn't otherwise think to do for the sake of survival and he talks about how he's looking at this bloody scab on one of his friend's legs and in so many words he's sort of salivating over it like it looks appetizing to him uh, in a way that he abhors and that he's terrified of, but he also notices the same look on the other people around him, on their faces, as they're sort of all coming to this sort of cognizant recognition that it's like, yeah, I was also looking at that leg and licking my lips and thinking about, you know, how it represents food. And eventually they do resort to um, <clears throat> deciding about how they're going to sort of divvy up what they then refer to as just meat. They refer to it as meat or protein. They recognize that they are withering away on this mountain, that they need protein to survive. Otherwise, they're not going to because they have gone through all of the very meager rations that they could find, like airline peanuts and, and a, you know, a few bags of candy. And, and um, at one point, they find a, an old sandwich along the way and an old suitcase. And it's incredibly gripping. And it talks a lot about what they endured in a way that makes you really feel like you're right there with them. And again, I highly recommend the audiobook of this because Arthur Morey's description of this is um, deep and gripping in a way that fits the story. And towards the latter half of the book, uh, he talks about how he uh, pursues various, you know, ideas about how to get themselves rescued alongside his other friends, including Tintin and um, Roberto. And um, at this point, there are about 16 or 17 survivors up there, and they're realizing that, that help is not coming, or if it is, that they can't find them. Eventually, they sort of jimmy away to take the plane's radio and take it away and power it up with another battery that they find. And they just happen to hear that the search and rescue has been called off. And so they decide that in order to 
to survive, they have to do something. And so they set out on, as, a, as a small team of two or three people uh, using things like the seats, the seat covers from the fuselage and using um, various bits of tin and metal from the plane to act as snowshoes and, and warm coverings. And they carry this sort of makeshift stuff uh, with them and they find the fuselage going in one direction, thinking that maybe they can go down the mountain and find help. And they find the fuselage and they realize that um, some of the equipment that they were hoping was going to be there, like a radio that would allow them to contact back out, um, doesn't work. And so this small team of two or three people comes back, including Nando, comes back to the fuselage with the rest of the crew, who is too weak at that point to really do much. And then they decide what their next steps are going to be. And that includes um, what culminates in sort of the final trek in one direction um, up over the top of the crest of a mountain that they're staring at, and then down uh, you know, the 45 or 50 miles to a village. And eventually they find the small farm and they, um, they, they communicate with this, this peasant farmer out in this very rural area. Um, they think that they are in Chile, but they're actually in Argentina. And eventually um, help does come find them. And then a rescue copter comes and takes Nando uh, up back into the mountain so he can show them where the rest of the survivors are. And they cannot believe that he managed to survive. They cannot believe that he managed to even walk down, up, uh, over, and then back down the other side of this mountain. Because if a trained mountain climber had done this, they would have almost certainly taken special equipment and uh, all sorts of oxygen gear. They would have done no more than about a thousand foot elevation increase per day. Uh, and they were doing two or 3,000 a day, uh, basically wearing shorts and some short sleeves and some seat cushion covers uh, and various bits of insulation that they had managed to, to pull from the wreckage. It is a remarkable story about life itself. Um, and he actually at one point writes in this, uh, he says, people want to focus on the disaster and the tragedy, but we were terrified and that's not the point. I can't glorify or romanticize what happened to us. And again, he's writing with such an unflinching honesty. Uh, it seems so vivid and so real uh, that you feel like you're alongside them for better or worse in the entirety of this experience. But he also starts realizing about life and what it means to be alive and how they're talking about how several of them would wake up every morning after having slept through a brutally cold night uh, on this mountain in this fuselage with no heat, and no light, and no electricity, no nothing. Uh, and they would say, I am not going to die today. Or they would have their own sort of routine about what it was they were saying and what it meant for them uh, to continue to live. And for some of them, that was getting back to, in this case of Nando, getting back to his father. For others, getting back to a girlfriend. Because uh, again, remember they're 20, 30 years old by and large. Uh, or getting back to their families in some way. And he's also, Nando is also talking about how he's realizing that uh, most everyone probably just assumes that he's dead. They, they, they don't necessarily assume, they just feel, they, they know, right? They know that they are dead. And he writes at one point to think about, quote, I did not leave a very big hole. He thinks about his life and sort of how people would have moved on at that point. Uh, and, you know, that, that he just didn't leave a big hole. And I find that to be a remarkably, a remarkably touching um, a, a sort of thing that I think we all sort of know in the back of our minds and that we don't come to terms with. We don't come to terms with it, maybe because we don't have the same, uh, we don't face the same level of, of disaster or trauma or the same um, threat of death as somebody in the situation of Nando would have been facing. They encounter an avalanche at one point and uh, they, they start to hallucinate and that um, one of the things that come across is that after they had come back down the mountain, after the rescue copters had come to retrieve them, um, some of the press did not believe them. And this sort of struck me as similar to today's news is that back in the 70s, uh, people thought that 
the story, for example, about an avalanche that had come along uh, was fake. Because at one point they were trying to scale up one side of a mountain uh, looking for help and an avalanche occurs and it actually buries several people and they die uh, under the uh, crushed under the avalanche. But they also use those people ultimately for food. And he says uh, that the people thought that the avalanche was fake and that they made the whole thing up so that way they could eat other people, that they actually murdered somebody and just said it was an avalanche so that way they could eat them. And that reminded me that sometimes people can't grok terrible things. There are events and things that happen to people um, in the course of human events that people just cannot wrap their arms around. And I think that when we do this sort of stuff, like if you think about 9-11 um, is another example of this, that we just think this is so terrible, there's no way this could happen. And so this is how you end up with conspiracy theories about people who uh, you know, think that like, Columbine didn't happen or that the Newtown shootings didn't happen or these other terrible events in, in human history just didn't happen. And even on scales of things like the Holocaust, that people just assume that these things can't happen. Therefore, it has to be something else because there's just no way that this sort of thing can actually occur to human beings. And for another contingent of people, they are keenly aware of this recognition. I don't think Nando Parado was keenly aware that people thought that they would be making any of this up. But I'm reminded too about how after the liberation of some of the Nazi concentration camps, that uh, once General Eisenhower arrived at the scene of one of the camps, he demanded that um, photographers come and document as much as possible because he recognized that what he was seeing was so terrifying and so uh, visually striking and so almost unbelievable in its capacity of awfulness that there would be people who would think that it did not happen. And what a prescient thing to think uh, in that moment to recognize that there will be people who either immediately or in the future will think that there is no way that this could have happened. And then making the recognition of documenting it in a way uh, that allows people to understand, no, this, this actually did happen. At one point when, they, when the surviving uh, few went to find uh, an escape route and they come across the fuselage, or excuse me, they come across the, the tail of the plane, they actually do uncover the camera. And there are some photos of this event where you can see black and white photos of people who have you know, really withered to almost nothing. Again, these were people who were at the prime of their athletic selves. Um, and it, they're striking images. And it's worth a Google uh, to see these photos and to recognize what it was these folks went through. I think that ultimately the, the mission and the, and the outcome of this book was that, uh, as Nando says, life is worth living. And that they reminded themselves all through this event that you do not waste a breath, that so long as you're breathing, you're, you are living and to never waste a breath. And it's at the end of the journey where he's sort of going up over this mountain, ultimately almost by himself, him and Roberto are, are kind of together looking for help off the side of this mountain to get other people back uh, to the, the fuselage. And they're worried about all the things that would be reasonable to worry about. They're worried about whether or not they will survive, that if they fail, that everyone else is counting on them and that they too will die. They're worried about what if the rescuers do happen to come across them at some point uh, and that they're not there because they went looking for help. Uh, and so in that experience, he's also realizing that the opposite of death isn't living, it's love. And he says this with such a conviction about and such a clarity that it just seems like the, the sort of the, as close to a, a near religious experience as you could possibly imagine. And you might think that religion factors into a lot of this. And he talks about this a little bit in the book about how he doesn't disrespect the faith of other people um, who view either him or Roberto as sort of the hand or instruments of God who went to help, you know, survive, you know, went to go help uh, get help and help the rest of them survive. Um, but he also questions this. I think that in a very deft way, he questions whether God was truly there or not, because he can't reconcile how, you know, th this poor group of 16 survivors 
should survive because they were somehow chosen ones, whereas his mother or his sister somehow were not. And thinking about his father and all this experience, that's what drives him to say the opposite of death isn't living, it's love. And so I highly recommend this book. If you like anything that's adventurous, that's real, it's very raw, it is, um, it is graphic uh, in, its, in its story, just sort of by nature of what it is. But I highly recommend it, and I highly recommend the audiobook version of this because it puts lots of things into perspective, and it's a fascinating story that has lots of parallels um, today, even based off of a story that happened um, 50 years ago in the 1970s. Great book.